Um, further to um, Nicholas' comments around uh, around inclement weather in Edinburgh, um, I think that might have that might have brought on my cold. So I can apologise in advance for my my throaty tones. Um, if there's anything that, that people don't, don't understand, uh, I do apologise. Do let me know. Um, okay, so uh, I just want to say a few brief words of introduction about about the project in general and the specific theme that we'll be focusing on today. Uh, before handing over to the two uh, presenters. Um, so obviously the, the aim of the Scottish Council of Deans of Education Scottish Attainment Challenge project uh, is to develop initial teacher education to better prepare teachers to work productively to close the, the poverty related gap uh, in schooling outcomes. Um, there are five related themes within the SCD project uh, and this afternoon's seminar relates to project theme two, uh, which, as you can see, there is is entitled "Flourishing uh, and Belonging: uh, An Ethic of Care." Specifically, uh, the, the the intention of the seminar today uh, is to focus on self care and connection amongst pre service and, and early career teachers working in schools uh, serving high SIMD areas, uh, how they experience their work. Uh, and how it relates to their expectations about teaching uh, will be some of the things that are considered. Uh, drivers and barriers to feeling effective are, are going to be explored, as well as the development of their sense of agency and empowerment, uh, for example, through things like practitioner inquiry. Um, so in terms of the structure, this, the seminar will entail presentations from the universities of Aberdeen and Edinburgh, um, describing projects at each of those institutions. Um, and by way of discussion, um, I'll relate each of those projects to a third project uh, at University of Glasgow, uh, which I'll describe uh, in more detail later on. Um, but the first presentation today is, 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 is from the University of Aberdeen um, and explores an asset-based an asset approach uh, focused on the lived experiences of students and and early career teachers in high SIMD settings. Uh, the background to the University of Aberdeen study uh, is that it emerges from the recognition in policy that poverty is detrimental to academic achievement uh, and for the need to better prepare new teachers uh, for inclusion. Uh, taking an asset-based asset -based approach, uh, the Aberdeen study explores how the lived experiences of probationary teachers uh, uh, can be, uh, you should try to surface those experiences and highlight what they can do in terms of uh, enacting inclusion in, in high poverty school environments. Uh, the study highlights uh, a potential way forward for supporting new teachers to recognize uh, when they are making progress with inclusion uh, and also perhaps to, to, to alleviate feelings of unpreparedness as well. Um, so that's by way of brief uh, preamble. Uh, but uh, I'll hand over to, to Archie at this point, um, who will, uh, Dr. Archie Graham, uh, who will uh, present on this specific project. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this University of Aberdeen presentation, uh, an assets-based exploration of probationer teachers' lived experiences of enacting an inclusive pedagogical approach in schools located in high poverty environments. The background to our study emerges from the recognition in policy and poverty that po poverty is detrimental to academic achievement and the need to prepare new teachers for inclusion. In Scotland, the Scottish Teacher Education Committee's National Framework for Inclusion 2014 and the Scottish Government's 2015 Scottish Attainment Challenge are two examples of current policy initiatives that underpin the promotion of inclusive education. Within this policy landscape, teachers and teacher educators are viewed as important contributors in responding to increasingly diverse learner groups. Schools located in communities with high levels of poverty present further challenges for teachers and by extension for teacher educators that go beyond the focus and standard educational provision with teachers in such schools taking on increasing responsibilities to help learners participate meaningfully in school. It's well known that many teachers feel unprepared to work with diverse learner groups and there's a lack of guidance around how inclusive pedagogies might be implemented. 
Our aim here is to explore the lived experiences of probationary teachers to surface and highlight what probationary teachers can do in terms of enacting inclusion in high poverty school environments. Our theoretical background is informed by inclusive pedagogy has researched in the work of Florian and Black Hawkins 2011 which takes a socio-cultural perspective in learning and is concerned with achieving positive educational outcomes for all learners. Underpinned by a commitment to addressing learner differences without marginalising or stigmatising learners, inclusive pedagogy is recognised in the literature as being uh, underpinned by um, three key assumptions. Uh, the first is that difference between learners should be expected in any conceptualisation of learning that teachers must believe they're capable of teaching all learners, and three, teachers will develop creative and new ways of working with others. The inclusive pedagogy approach in action, uh, the IPAA framework uh, from Florian and Spratt 2013, is used to address the methodological problem of context as a confusing variable in research and inclusive pedagogy by replacing judgments about whether or not inclusion has taken place by an exploration of the extent to which a principled stance is enacted. The IPAA links the three key assumptions of inclusive pedagogy to observable teaching practices and provides a way to document links between the principles and the assumptions of inclusive pedagogy and their enactment. In our study, we linked the IPAA with an asset-based approach by Garvin, McLean and Patoni 2016 to explore probationer teachers and enactment of inclusive pedagogy in terms of what they can do rather than what they cannot. There are several aspects of an asset-based approach that are relevant to our study. A focus on assets adopts a values-driven approach without disregarding the structural, social and economic challenges or circumstances an individual may be confronted with. It aims to unlock the potential of what people and institutions bring to a situation it promotes the mobilisation of assets and recognises the importance of being sensitive to context. Such an approach is consistent with the aims of our study. We designed uh, an exploratory multiple case study to examine how the probation of teachers enact inclusive pedagogy in schools located in high poverty environments. Each probation or teacher served as their own case in terms of data collection to elicit detailed descriptions of their lived experiences. The purpose of examining multiple cases is to search for any replicating patterns with a view to strengthening the robustness of the findings. The first person reports were collected via classroom observation, semi-structured conversational interviews and reflective diaries to gather examples of the participants' lived experiences. In total, seven probationer teachers participated in the study. Four of the probationer teachers were placed in two primary schools and three were placed in the same secondary school. Our findings. Uh, we conducted a cross case analysis to identify any replicating patterns in terms of eliciting a better understanding of the context of probation that teachers were working in and what they were able to do in relation to inclusive pedagogy. Across the seven cases, we found examples of the probation of teachers' practices that were consistent with the principles and assumptions of inclusive pedagogy. The examples surfaced in relation to teaching strategies, additional support and working with others were based on probation of teachers' knowledge of their pupils and appropriate to their context, rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. Our finding, findings provide concrete examples of how probation of teachers extend what's ordinarily available in the class by adopting teaching practices to include all learners. For example, they made efforts to provide scaffolding, encourage learners to verbalise their thinking, provide an opportunity for experiential learning, and chunk lessons into smaller parts. They also created opportunities for learning so that all learners could participate in classroom life as illustrated by practices such as the use of visual aids, concrete materials, targeted use of teacher time and whole class reading to support access to planned learning. Our data also showed the importance of the probationers developing intra-professional working to help bridge the principles of inclusive pedagogy with their classroom practices. These intra-professional working practices were found to be mainly with uh, pupil support assistance. Well, such examples demonstrate the range of assets uh, that are ordinarily available to probationer teachers for enacting an inclusive pedagogical approach. They also highlight an implicit inclusion oriented relationality between the probationer teachers and the learners.
Our main insight is that an asset-based approach coupled with the inclusive pedagogical approach in action, the IPA framework, can help identify some of the possible ways through which probationary teachers can begin to enact an inclusive pedagogy in high poverty school contexts. Surfacing what they can do creates an opportunity for probationary teachers to recognise, articulate, explore and build upon their individual assets. Such an approach may help new teachers to reframe their feelings of unpreparedness and adopt a more positive narrative of their progress in learning to enact an inclusive pedagogy and to work with diverse learner groups. All the probationary teachers demonstrated practices in keeping with inclusive pedagogy, and they did so in different ways. These examples have potential to be mobilised to support others, for example, student teachers trying to imagine what inclusive pedagogy might look like in practice. Our study highlights a potential way forward for support to new teachers to recognise they are making progress in developing pedagogies that support meaningful participation for all learners, including those working in schools located in high poverty environments. Thank you for listening and the next slide has our list of references. Thanks, Archie. That's, uh, that's fantastic. So what I'll do now, uh, colleagues, is I'll, I'll just uh, briefly uh, draw out some of the some of the themes uh, within within the Aberdeen project, uh, as I as I see them relating to to the University of Glasgow project. Um, and uh, but but while I'm doing that, can I can I just uh, in encourage colleagues to to post comments or questions in the chat related to the Aberdeen project, the presentation that you've just seen, um, and then following the, the connections I draw with the Glasgow project, we can then explore some of those questions uh, and Archie can respond to, 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 to comments uh, and, and, and observations raised. Um, so in terms of the, in, to, to, uh, in terms of the, there are a number of areas of resonance, I think, with uh, between the University of Aberdeen project as described by Archie and the University of Glasgow project. Uh, I should say very briefly what the University of Glasgow project is. So the University of Glas Glasgow project uh, considers what benefits can be derived from student teachers, pre-service teachers, uh, conducting and sharing practitioner inquiries, uh, which are focused on the poverty-related attainment gap. Uh, the particular focus for Glasgow is on this latter sharing element, what happens when student teachers share practitioner inquiries with one another that are focused uh, on SAC. Uh, so, in terms of the, the commonalities between Glasgow and Aberdeen, are the things that are that are being surfaced by both projects. Um, one thing that that, that, I, that I would I would certainly observe is is, is the emphasis on an asset based approach, uh, focused on what students can do. You know, this is this is very much present in in the Glasgow data, uh, related to ownership and autonomy over individual practitioner inquiries. Students emphasising. Uh, in the different focus groups that we've been conducting around the sharing of practitioner inquiries, uh, that the, the ownership and autonomy and, and playing to the strengths of the individual uh, practitioner uh, are really important. Uh, I'd also draw another parallel between the Aberdeen uh, and, and Glasgow projects uh, in terms of reframing the idea of preparedness. Um, it comes through in, in a slightly different way in the Glasgow data. Uh, but uh, in, in the Glasgow data, it, it's present as, uh, as preparing teachers to be independent uh, in their decision making through practitioner inquiry, preparing them in that sense and, 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 and helping them to see that that constitutes preparedness, uh, though obviously at the level appropriate to an early career teacher. Um, and I think that, that that's, a, that's a clear point of, of linkage as well. Um, observations that, that also resonate include the observation that, that the context matters and the individual complexities uh, of particular classrooms uh, and particular and, and, and particular poverty related contexts that these are significant that they matter that they influence uh, the understanding of, 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 of practitioners um, so I think at this point um, and what I, what, I, what, I, what I'd encourage colleagues to do is, is to is to broach questions or, or observations uh, for Archie in, in the chat or, or, or potentially verbally if you if you prefer. Um,
Hi, Kevin, it's Nicola. I'm not sure if there might be a problem with the chat. There's a couple of people who said they couldn't put it to everyone, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm looking at it and I look at the name section with the drop down arrow, I can see that I can put a message to everyone in the meeting, but I don't know if that's because I'm a host. Um, Paul Adams, I know you'd messaged me. Do you want to just check that? Yeah, will do. Sorry, I lost my window there. Um, That's all right, Paul. I no, think I, um, I, I think it might be um, in settings. And are you, are you the are you the host, Nicola? Yeah. I think you'll have it in in settings um, down at the bottom, and I think or down at the bottom of the um, chat box. Nicola, if, if it's okay while we're, we're waiting, I, I could kick off with a question for Archie, if if I may. Archie, thanks for that. Um, it struck me when I was looking, when you were talking about inclusive pedagogy and you were listing the, the three boxes, uh, areas. Um, uh, it, it struck me that, that that's just pedagogy. I, 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 well, a, a particular view of, of pedagogy. I, I wonder whether it's time to drop the term inclusive and actually just start talking about good pedagogy. Yeah, I, I kind of re recognise that, that, that uh, Paul. I think what, what one of the things that I suppose that we were we were looking at was the level of intentionality, and that uh, you know that the, the the participants in our study did did be, you know start from an intention of trying to be inclusive, and you know um, and again we were just looking to see again what was ordinarily available, just things that we would you know, expect of all. The probationers and student teachers to be able to access and to see how they were mobilizing that, that so yeah it's you know as you say you know that it is a sort of contested area and it's is difficult but i think the, the i suppose in our study that that was where we were kind of focusing on to, uh, the level of intentionality between you know um committing to uh, what is referred to as an inclusive pedagogy approach and how that was enacted in in the schools I, I, it was really interesting you used the, the, the word intentionality. I, I mean, I would, if that wasn't the intention, intention of the teacher, then I'd be worried. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I mean, all that I, I think is really good stuff that they're doing. So I'm, it, it kind of fills me with hope that our new teachers of whatever age are coming in and, and doing all this stuff. And I just wonder sometimes whether um, in trying to promote something, in, in trying to promote something, we obviously promote the not something as well, don't we? And we, um, yeah. I wonder whether sometimes, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's not a criticism of anything you've done at all. It's just something mm. that struck me as I was looking at your thing. I, I just wonder whether, you know, talking about this as, in, in, you know, the intentionality of inclusive pedagogy, uh, which, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong, that's a good thing. I just wonder whether that kind of language gives space for people in kind of other ways who, who are avowedly not about inclusion not about you know they are avowedly about practices that are perhaps exclusionary uh in in their orientation um i i, I mean i don't know i mean I, I don't quite know what i'm thinking here really it's just a, it, it just struck me as quite it resonated quite a lot with me that this is a very positive thing that young people are doing young, young teachers new teachers are doing and not all young young uh, new teachers are doing um and i, and I just wonder whether uh that focus on in, in, uh, uh, on, the, on the notion of inclusion um, it some, somehow gets in the way and gives an excuse for people to not do these sorts of things. And I'm particularly mindful of things that I see on Twitter that emanate from other countries that avowedly do not talk about those things and deliberately talk against those things. And I wonder whether we give space to those people by talking about inclusive pedagogy, when in fact what we should be talking about is just pedagogy. Yeah, I suppose again, we, we were, from our point of view, I suppose it's just you know you know that the you know within the policy landscape which we're working in Scotland, etc. And this idea about you have to start somewhere with 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 with, with your student teachers and your, and your probationers, and uh, um, that's one of the sort of key questions that sort of drives us because we can all kind of imagine of you know what you know the. You know that the, the you know that the perfect classroom would look like the most inclusive classroom would look like you know but we also know that that takes years 
you know, to develop in terms of becoming, you know, a skilled practitioner. So I suppose the question really, you know, that, we, that we're really grappling with in our study is, so where do you start? Okay. And, you know, what are the types of tangible things that our, our students, teachers and our probationers in the, in the study can actually do and, and that they can do in, you know, environments that, you know, that are challenging and you really begin to grow from. And, you know, with the, the sort of close of pedagogy, we find with our students, you know, that that is, is, is a good way in, you know, and we recognise its limitations, etc. But, you know, as a starting point for them to begin to think about what, you know, uh, all the kids in the class and, you know, uh, and, and everyone, it's, you know, it, it, it is a good entry point. But again, it just, we need to, we need more guidance in terms of how, to, how, how the students and the probation of teachers can operationalise that at the stage they're at in their professional development. Jacqueline, you'd like to come in here? Yeah, please. It was taking me too long to try and type it and make any sense of what I was actually thinking. So I thought it'd be easier just to ask. Um, I've just recently finished a systematic review looking at beginner teachers in Scotland, facilitators and barriers to do with inclusion and differentiation. And one of the big sort of barriers that came through was that idea of beginner teachers not feeling qualified enough to teach the diverse range of children within a classroom and something that was reported in literature and I suppose my question is does, does this come through from the voice of the probation teachers to help with that barrier as a facilitator was that partnership work that you mentioned was mentioned in one of the slides um, and I suppose my question is you'd mentioned about working with say support for learning assistance or such as a partnership type, were there any other experiences that the probation teachers shared which helped them to feel they were qualified enough and to think how they could teach that everybody sort of inclusive scenario, you know, with social services or educational psychologists? I don't know if you've actually seen that in practice and I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, and it's something we have been looking at, not particularly in the, in the slides that we, we, we showed today, uh, but one of the things we've um, been discovering as, as we've been kind of work, working with our student teachers and the probation of teachers is they don't actually get an opportunity to work with other agencies um, and actually you know it's you know, you know it's mostly in, intra-professional opportunities to get you know other teachers in the staff room it's you know the a PSA if they're lucky enough to have have a PSA in, in, in the classroom and very few of them you know get a, an opportunity to to work uh, with others and quite a lot of them actually have um, you know perhaps information withheld from them because they're, they're student teachers you know um, and had they perhaps been in, a, in another you know, profession, I don't know, nursing, health, physics, etc. As as students, they would have access to information that perhaps our our student teachers, as, as beginning professionals, don't get access to. So, um, and those that do uh, tend to have um, perhaps wider experience, it tends to happen by chance or, or luck. So it's not a an orchestrated you know uh, pro progression that they have. So one of the things that we were sort of looking at is that. They, they, they can start from intra-professional relationships and they can build from that and you know within that what might be the skills and you know the, the attributes you know that we would look for to enhancing the you know the the, the, the experience uh, for, you know, for, for the learners so that that's why we we, we centered in on that uh, you know particular aspect because of the the seven participants they were all able to engage in intra-professional working so across all the sites uh, that that was something that came to the surface, but yeah, that whole kind of you know that you know that it's a collective problem, you know, and yet you know we we don't necessarily open up the opportunities for our, our, our beginner teachers to have those those opportunities uh, to work with with other agencies etc. It's something in, I mean I know our data set isn't huge, but it, it it does begin to kind of raise questions as to why might that not be the case. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could. Um, I wonder if we could just uh, engage with with, with with two of the questions that are in the chat before we before we move to the uh, presentation. So, David, I wonder, do you want do you want to uh, elaborate on that on that question for Archie? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it, it follows on from the sort of area that uh, Jacqueline's talking about in terms of uh, engagement with others and working with others. Um, we might expect that uh, there would be a difference in 
engagement with support for learning teachers as against pupil support assistance and I think particularly in terms of early career teachers um, we might expect support for learning teachers to, to take a degree of responsibility um, rather than just the engagement with pupil support assistance in the classrooms and I just wondered if any of that was picked up. Again, yeah, not, not so much in, with uh, the, the predation of teachers in this study but in the the, the wider data set that we have with uh, the student teachers um, often you know the you know they, they didn't get access again to the you know the support for learning teachers uh, as much as you might hope and they, they often perceive themselves you know uh, to be just basically at the, at the bottom of the tree in terms of access to, 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 to others. So it's, it's quite interesting when you, know, when you look at this sort of, you know, the sort of progression from the student teacher into the probationer teacher that we've, trying, we've been trying to look at that in the, in the sort of the, the bigger picture within the study, you know, um, as in terms of how they start to get more opportunity to work with others. Um, but, it, you know, at, at this stage, it doesn't seem to be as wide ranging as, you know, you know perhaps we'd like to see. And, uh, and Nicola, a, a really interesting question around reflective diaries. Yes, I, I, it's partly coming from um, interested in self, well, I use self-study as a methodology and I was really interested in using reflective diaries. And it's interesting as a research method, but just wondering if the, the, the probation or teachers find it helpful and find it helpful for thinking about that concept of inclusion and about the, the context that they were in. Yeah, they, they did, and, and some of the, the best data we got was from the reflective diaries, um, and you know we had basically four um, just fairly generic questions that they all asked. We used audio recorders, so they, they didn't write; they just at the end of the day they just spoke the thoughts onto onto the the, the dictaphones. And uh, as I say, the, the richness of that data was was really quite insightful um, and probably richer than what we got from the observations and and, and the, the semi structured interviews. Thanks, Arch. It's really interesting to hear that, and I thought that might be the case given. Yeah. That, that that's the kind of methodology I'm interested in. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And be good to see um, if you're, I think you'll be able to do some, uh, are you plans to publish with that data if it's if it was so rich or? Yeah, we, 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 are, we, are, we are hoping to do that. And um, we had, as I said, you know, our initial research design had been, you know, to obviously recruit more, more participants, you know, and, uh, and just with the COVID pandemic and, you know, students willingness to participate with everything else they were doing it was very difficult because that was that was a big part of what we were going to take forward because uh, yeah it was very successful in terms of the the, the, the quality of the data we got thanks thank you yeah. exactly i have to say that resonates with the glasgow project as well you know that that, that, that the critical importance of, of, of reflecting on 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 their own practice but also crucially being able to share those reflections with others um, okay, so I, so I think at this point we'll move to, to uh, the presentation from the University of Edinburgh. I'll just say a, a brief couple of words of preamble. Um, so the next presentation uh, focuses on exploring safe space uh, through student teachers' existential mapping of their ITE trajectories, uh, from benchmarked well-doing to experiential well-being, exploring how students negotiate their journeys towards meaningful uh, professional practice. Uh, so I'll hand over to Christian at this point. Yeah, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, so my name is uh, Christian Hanser. I am a PhD student in the third year um, in the Scottish Entertainment Challenge uh, Research Project. And uh, my research is embedded in the, the wider focus with my colleagues from uh, Murray House on uh, outdoor education. So um, when we uh, when we look at um, the literature about uh, pre-service teachers starting their placements, often they can experience a, a conflict uh, with their ideas and their, their imagined realities and then what is happening on the ground. And uh, just uh, imagine you enter as a student teacher uh, the school and someone in, in who's already in the system uh, tells you when, when you question sometimes overwhelming workloads that you're confronted with, well, that is what the career, career is like. You won't get an outside life. 
So that's a kind of uh, conflict that uh, student teachers can encounter in their placement. And uh, the notion of self-care, when it is not uh, um, talked about, it can also lead to a culture of silence and um, actually making uh, those teachers who could really be capable to, to help close the attainment gap in a considerable way, they might uh, also silently depart. So this question of uh, teacher retention. And in my research, I really looked at hopes, dreams, and the frustrations of teachers as potential carriers of change for the profession, uh, something that needs to be preserved to be looked at more rather than uh, just taken aside as unrealistic expectations or on the other hand, uh, instrumentalized as some duty of the individual to change uh, something. So it's uh, um, looking at uh, peer processes. My research question uh, so looks at how student teachers navigate their journeys uh, between their hopes and dreams and the placement realities. And in the first year of my PhD, I um, looked at uh, elements for a map, um, the kind of topics that are not so much talked about in ITE uh, uh, trajectories. In the center is the path of self-care and many other issues around. And I, uh, I had this map just as a, the way to start the conversations. And then on the picture on the right, you see uh, blank pages. And I invited student teachers to, uh, to, to take a blank page and to map their own intrinsic journey. So what they perceive on, from the inside. The methodological approach, it's not so much testing efficiency of an activity. It was much more about opening a space and seeing what happens. Uh, so also in the literature, there's a big focus on doing um, and on activities but uh, it's also important to look at uh, the curricular spaces of being. And I want to also make here the distinction that Viesta has made um, about learning as acquisition. So uh, acquisition of new and new skills in ITE, but also learning as responding. And that's where I try to open this space, inviting student teachers to, uh, to express, uh, to show who they are and uh, to express where they stand. It was an arts-based uh, narrative inquiry, so non-linear, approach and in the center of this that what was holding this together it's an outdoor uh, classroom it's an outdoor setting uh, that uh, very experiential in, in nature you see it here from the inside it's uh, the inside of a shepherd's hut uh, that uh, was used uh, to facilitate this mapping and storytelling processes and on the left you see the wood fire stove uh, really central to to this whole uh, um, methodological processes and I had prepared small questions to start the conversations, but then essentially it was also about giving this uh, space where the student teachers who participated, they could uh, decide um, how much they engage and was also a space of being to uh, share time uh, being together. It's an informal process and you, what is important to point out, it was an extracurricular experiential workshop. So it was embedded in uh, uh, like in the, um, and master's uh, transformative learning and teaching, which is a two year route into uh, teaching, but it uh, took place outside of the, um, uh, the, the classes. So the, in the end, uh, in, uh, in my invitation, I was very fortunate to have 12 student teachers out of a cohort of more than 20 uh, students uh, to say, yeah, I, I will engage in this. I will take my free time and, and come to this uh, shepherd's hut. And uh, there were two groups uh, engaging and the first three sessions, they could take place in the heart. And then uh, the fourth session had to be moved online because of uh, the global pandemic. So I have uh, several analysis. I focus here on the facilitation process. I'm in the middle of analyzing the artifacts and uh, just like uh, in the Aberdeen project, the reflective diaries here, it's the artistic artifacts that also provide very rich data. And uh, also what is important is the facilitation project, uh, the, the facilitation process, and reconceptualizing spaces of being as part of ITE design. So I started to conceptualize sanctuary and refuge as part of uh, ITE curriculum. Uh, here, the aim is to shift the attention from the technical and also sometimes quite individualistic learning to cope skills and spaces towards introspective allowance to thrive spaces for co and peer care. 
uh, in especially in focus on teacher resilience, there can be this notion that it's the individual teacher that needs to acquire resilience, but there are also other approaches, non-Western approaches on, on community resilience. And I think Cohen Peer Care is about sharing uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this quest and this search for thriving spaces. It's also uh, to respond to a lack of, um, of, of spaces where teachers can renew their craft. It's not only student teachers, but teachers as they progress, they uh, yeah they might lack uh, those spaces to renew and to disconnect to better return. And uh, in in this uh, methodology and also in the conceptualization of sanctuary, it's not so much about being productive and achieving, and more of being present in the moment. So listening to the student teachers, um, it, uh, it can be interesting to reflect on a shelter for being and uh, this right to pause within IT trajectories to reframe these, the cultures of sacrifice that uh, student teachers can be confronted with. And in uh, the storytelling that was taking place, uh, one thing I really want to focus on is the uh, limitations uh, student teachers can feel inside the school uh, one uh, statement at the, at the bottom, so closed inside the school, uh, not knowing what the weather is, what the day looks like. And I think when we talk about SIMD and uh, Scottish Attainment Challenge, uh, the areas, uh, SMIMD one and two, four areas, it's not about only about the testing that happens in the schools, it's a lot about the community in which these schools uh, are. Another um, suggestion from the research is about uh, looking at uh, uh, an, an outlook on policy as de-optimizing, so a sanctuary as disruption. Uh, because of the, the constant uh, self-optimization logics uh, taking place in, in, uh, in, in assessment, uh, it, it can be interesting to look also at the uncontrollab uncontrollability of the world and about uh, what happened with COVID, with the, the shifts that, that uh, also make uh, some disorder in the testing schemes as a way um, to embed policy and uh, assessment within uh, these these challenges, these uh, shifts in uh, in society. So, having done part of my PhD during COVID, uh, I think uh, it can also be an invitation to to look at uh, ways uh, to learn to deal with these uncontrollable situations and to much more be uh, be with uh, the people, be with the situations, then the accountability. And re refocusing also the angles that we have on retention. And uh, in retention, we can focus a lot on the external, on the external um, uh, requirements to keep uh, uh, teachers uh, in, um, in the profession. And what uh, my research has looked at is also in the intrinsic uh, values and uh, the intrinsic parts that can be preserved in uh, the, the teacher trajectories. So it can be about uh, nurturing long-term service and belonging through um, making space for the unique and singular that is in every uh, teacher. It's a more existential approach. Uh, what I want to highlight here is that Within uh, so this mapping that took place, it was very far from the assessment of the MSc uh, of the MSc teaching, but some student teachers decided to submit the maps they had come uh, uh, that they had created in the in the Shepherd's Hut. They submitted them in their uh, master's portfolio. So uh, it's by detour that uh, these artistic processes of being they came back to the formal curriculum, and so it can be interesting to look at. Um, at engagement uh, with being and uh, with their intrinsic values by way of Detroit indirect pedagogy. So I have a few more um, ideas for, for further debate and I will look forward to your questions. Fantastic, thanks Christian. Uh, I think, uh, again, colleagues, can I, can I encourage you to, to, to post comments uh, or questions for, for Christian in, in, the, in the chat? Uh, also, for obviously, of course, to, to raise those verbally if you prefer as well. Uh, I think while, while colleagues are moving that over, I think uh, I'd offer some reflections in terms of how the Glasgow project and the, and the Edinburgh projects link together. Uh, for me, I think that there are three key areas. Um, 
you know, the Glasgow project, just to reiterate, is focused on practitioner inquiry and the sharing of practitioner inquiries amongst pre-service teachers. And so the emphasis in the Edinburgh project around the importance of moments of reflection uh, and of shared reflection, I mean, that's clearly going to be integral to the idea of practitioner inquiry and to sharing practitioner inquiries. Uh, and those that, I mean, that will be also be very much present in the Glasgow data. Similarly, the idea of personalised journeys in ITE, facilitating flourishing and belonging, I think that's very much there in our data too. Uh, I mean, this is intrinsic to the idea of a personalised and autonomous practitioner inquiry. Um, and those notions of, of, of personalisation and autonomy actually link back very interestingly uh, to some of the asset-based uh, uh, approach explored uh, by Archie, of course. Uh, I think a final area of, 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 of shared resonance between the Glasgow and Edinburgh projects is the distinction between coping and thriving uh, that, that we can see in the Edinburgh project. Uh, the Glasgow data suggests that, that a community of, of, of practitioner inquiry is integral to the idea of thriving. Uh, and obviously, Christian's identified a number of other ways in which, in which thriving can be, can be emphasised uh, as a way of flourishing and belonging in the profession. Uh, okay, so if I, if I could open up the conversation to, um, to, 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 to colleagues now, can, can I invite, invite questions or comments for Christian? Okay, Christine, so we've got a, a question in the, in the chat there from Nicola. Uh, Nicola, do you, do you want to elaborate on that or? Yes, I can, thank you. Um, I think it was just, it was it was also interesting, Christian, and the, the ideas of taking time and pausing and and the, the narrative aspect of what you're looking at and the artifacts, I think is really interesting. And I just think the point that you made on the final slide there about less doing for and more being with, and I wonder, I think that's a really interesting thought and I think it's something that perhaps we need to focus on more across the whole education system and that do we spend too much time doing and not enough pausing and being with and in that moment and I think that it was just a really interesting point that you raised and linked with the points you were making Kevin about about practitioner inquiry and and, and that's certainly the area of research that I'm interested in as well and I found that that it's having that time to be in the moment and think about it and reflect on it and reflect on practice is actually hugely empowering. So, um, sorry, yeah, Christian, that's just a, a thought I raised. Yeah, and I, I think that um, uh, there are um, lots of observations we can make about the, uh, the spaces of pause and of, of rest uh, becoming more and more scarce. And also when we, with, with COVID-19, we also see that there is uh, yeah, um, there are lots of shifts also about these, these spaces and who can occupy them, who has the right to retreat and who has the right to pause. And for me, uh, having done uh, this research as an optional activity in a two years master's program, now the next question is um, in the fast track route of uh, ITE, like the PGDE, which is much more time compressed, is there any possibility to uh, allow these spaces to, to invite into sanctuary Although there the, the time is even more dense, uh, but isn't it maybe because the time is even more dense that there should be also this thought about when uh, do, do the student teachers rest? And uh, in some of the articles I've come across this, this culture, I've, su I've survived the PGDE. And uh, this is something that, uh, yeah, it could be challenged and um, challenged through spaces of being and of safe spaces. Thank you. And some really interesting comments as well in the chat. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, two related comments from, from, from David and Claire uh, around uh, the notion of safe space and, and informal safe spaces and, uh, and smaller and divided uh, staff rooms, or sometimes what's referred to as the silent staff room. Uh, really interesting comments there. I wonder whether David or Claire you'd like to, to elaborate on either of those. I'm not sure about the elaboration, but uh, the end when uh, ideas were uh, spinning around your head, 
the opportunity to engage with colleagues in an informal setting. In my case, it was a pub on a Friday afternoon to uh, talk through the week and uh, generate ideas and just uh, uh, express views of how the week is going. It was uh, an informal way, but uh, a very helpful way of, of leaving stuff behind uh, after, after a tiring week. My comment was just really if, if I worked in a school with a, a very large staff room um, and I'm hearing more and more that these are now being divided into smaller staff rooms due to COVID, so you know the infant bubble and the, the senior bubble. Um, but if that's not a space that you're comfortable in, then where do you go at lunch or, or break? And there's there's no safe space, there's no area for you to go and have a chat with someone that's not in that bubble. It's a forced uh, place and I just found it really interesting, Christian, of what of all of what you were saying about that, um, having that time to to pause and reflect. Um, but if that's not in your staff room, then it's it's very difficult. Yeah, I think there has been uh, a few years ago. There has been uh, there have been articles published about the classroom being the sanctuary for teachers, and uh, but in in a time when there's more and more. Uh, accountability and uh, there are lots of uh, testing uh, pressures to also confront, be confronted with um, maybe the, the classroom alone and especially for student teachers who don't have their own fixed classroom yet. I think there is this, this challenge where is this anchor for uh, student teachers in, in this uh, period, uh, in this period of uh, transition and of uh, intro introduction into the school. And yeah, the, this uh, notion of going beyond uh, the classroom, but also going beyond the school to the community, to the outdoor and to all kinds of different spaces, I think is really important. And uh, you mentioned in the chat that um, pausing beyond the hut, what was interesting in the research is because the last session was shifted because of COVID. Um, so it wasn't anymore about the hut, but it was about uh, some experience that uh, some student teachers who had taken part in the first three sessions, they took into their garden or they, they, they continue to engage in that kind of uh, experiential spirit, but they didn't need the physical space of the hut anymore. It was important for the start, but then it went beyond that. And, and so I think every school can also uh, look at those uh, maybe underexplored resources that the outdoors or that certain localities can provide. Uh, and I think we've got time just to explore a couple of fascinating questions uh, from Jean uh, in the chat. Jean, would you like to uh, pose those to Christine? Absolutely. Uh, I wasn't surprised by the quotes that you had included from teachers who perhaps said, this is just how life is as a teacher. You know, this is how, how it's going to be. It's it's hard. And that whole idea that you, you need to actually be a martyr and suffer and then you'll get a break in the holidays that kind of of thing that, that's put forward to to early career teachers and I just really wondered if you had the the reverse of that some more positive insights of of that not being the case um, and I think you've already answered quite well the the question about thinking about outdoor spaces differently and other maybe even virtual spaces, although not ideal, but di different spaces being there uh, for pausing beyond the hut. But it's interesting that that evolved from creating that physical spatial space in the first instance. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I think um, that's where it's very important that um, the, the sessions where there were peer, uh, peer feedback and there was like a collective experience because uh, some some student teachers had uh, these experiences of um, yeah of, of uh, not seeing this this culture of, of uh, self-care in the schools but then there are also um, there, there were different angles coming together and I think in these negotiations uh, in, the, in the storytelling taking place in the heart there was um, yeah trying to um, yeah to inspire each other through the observation of spaces that were taking place, and yeah, of course there are um, there are also the very positive spaces. So uh, I think it's about um, so it's personalized, as Kevin pointed out before. It's it's a personalized search and negotiation, but it's also embedded in a collective uh, 
uh, journey. And I think that's really important that uh, often when we talk about self-care, it can be imagined as a bubble of just one person, but uh, making this as a very non-threatening and safe space for several people, it, uh, it can really inspire everyone brings in some resources, some observations, some, uh, some maybe also rejecting something about the school and the placement. And, but yeah, it's, it, that's where, where it's very important that it comes together as, um, as a shared uh, time of being. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks, Christy. Well, we're, we're coming up to the uh, to the half hour. Um, so, uh, uh, which would you suppose? Would you suppose at half past five? Uh, so, I just uh, I just wanted to make a, a few closing remarks. Um, first of all, uh, can I just highlight that this is? Uh, I just just shared the slide, but can I just just highlight that, uh, that this is the the second in a series of of, of five seminars. Uh, and that the remaining three themes that you can see there around reframing schooling, social justice, uh, and theory, policy, and experience, uh, that those uh, seminars will be coming soon. Um, can I also highlight uh, uh, as, as well uh, that there are various ways in which uh, we can keep the conversation going uh, through Twitter, as, uh, as, uh, as, as has already been highlighted uh, by Nicola, uh, and that uh, and that uh, there, there are various things here of, of note in respect to the advantages of, of CIRA membership uh, and, 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 to the, and, to the, and to the work of CIRA more broadly. Um, can I also particularly thank our, our two presenters, Christine and Archie, for, for, two, for two really fascinating and thought-provoking uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you to, 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 to the audience for posing such interesting questions uh, to our presenters. Uh, and also, finally, particular thanks to, uh, to, to, to Nicola and to Angela from, from, from CIRA uh, and to CIRA itself uh, for, for hosting this particular event. Um, so I think that that, uh, that concludes things. That, that's bringing us up to the half hour. Um,